Hello, and welcome to the dark side of the room. I'm your cinematic sorcerer, Solar T. Gray. And today, we're going to talk about Wonder Woman. Now, Wonder Woman from Warner Brothers, out in almost summer 2017. This is the first cinematic rendition of Wonder Woman there has ever, ever been. Now, we've seen a bunch of stuff from Warner Brothers and DC, from the Green Lantern to, ugh, the Green Lantern to, ugh, the Green freaking Lantern. But that was a long time ago. Since then, we've had a bunch of Batman movies. We've always had a bunch of Superman movies starting all the way back from 1978. And now after 39 years and 8 to 10 Superman movies and 8 to 10 Batman movies, we finally have the female member of the Trinity, Wonder Woman, in her very first cinematic debut. Gail Godot's Wonder Woman was... Well, you know how she got the role and people said, oh no, she's too thin. And truth, not gonna lie. I didn't care about how thin she was. I cared that she wasn't Megan Gale from Australia. <sighs> one day, one day I'll have that birthday party. Oh, I I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll save that for after the review. And what I have to say about Gail Godot's performance is I am happy I was mediocrely wrong. Um, I saw her in Batman vs. Superman, and she was honestly one of my favorite parts of the movie. I really liked the way that she was portraying the role, especially against Batman. But could she carry an entire movie? Quite honestly, I was afraid that they were going to do what certain other cinematic or television shows do when it comes to a female main character. I'm looking at you, Supergirl. And make Wonder Woman this two-dimensional, kind of flat, incomplete character. And truthfully, I'd never really seen Gal Gadot. Yeah, hey, I said it right. I'd never seen Gal Gadot in a lot of other things. I'm not a big fan of the Fast and Furious franchises, and frankly, I love alliteration. She didn't have a very big part in those movies, so could she carry an entire flick? Mm, well, we'll see. Well, turns out, as I said earlier, she can carry an entire flick, and her portrayal of Wonder Woman was the most three-dimensional character that I have seen since, oh, I don't know, Jodie Foster in Silence of the Lambs. She was strong, yet compassionate. She had concern, but she wasn't um, overly sappily sweet. And let's face it, she was naive, but she wasn't a friggin' moron. Okay, they do a lot of things in this movie about her character and about the mascara in general that I thought was really well done. Like the fact that these women know hundreds of foreign languages because you're on this island, what are you going to do? Fight, study, and talk to each other. And learning a lot of languages is a cool thing. Oh my god, these people know more than three languages. No one on earth can hold that much in their head. I love being American. Now the fight choreography in this movie was so good. And the way that they choreographed these Amazons were honestly some of the best fight scenes that weren't kung fu that I have seen since Troy. The creative use of her powers were really, really nice. And the cinematic way that they showed how she can block bullets um, was one of the better ways I've seen it. Not quite spoiler, because we see it on the commercial, but when it comes to the things flying at her, she kind of sees in slow motion she's that aware, and they don't spend time spelling it out. Um, now, this was not a perfect movie. Not a perfect movie at all. Um, it was close to being, but I've got a few gripes. The first major gripe I have, and this is big, okay? One of the plots of the backstory really drops the ball. You see, Wonder Woman 
is the comic book character from DC Comics that has an entire pantheon of mythological beings on speed dial. One of the hugest parts of her character is really her relationships with the gods, specifically the Greek ones. They worship Aphrodite and Hera and Athena. That's what they do. They've got the they've got the Greek gods there, but we're talking three goddesses. They had big old fights with Hades. They know Zeus, they know Apollo, they deal with the gods all the time. And in this movie, they kill all of the Greek pantheon except Ares. So they turn this monotheistic character into a dualism character. And that really cuts off a huge part of her character. That's a lot like saying it's a Superman story, but he's not an alien. And that was a major problem for me. I don't mind that Ares was the antagonist because anyone familiar with Wonder Woman lore, specifically from the comic books, would know that Ares is the bad guy. Sorry. Okay. Ares, Strife, look it up. Google is free. And they elum- they eliminated all of that. Um, the other, one of the other gripes I have about this movie is they do this thing, this thing that happens a lot, a whole lot in superhero stories, which is to protect the ones I love, I'm going to keep them in the dark about themselves or my superpowers. And that never, ever, ever works out well. Ever. It sucked for Spider-Man for 35 years. It sucked for the X-Men. It sucked for every single person that says, I want to protect you by lying by omission. Knock that shit off. I mean, really. Just just knock it off. Knock it off knock it off. I cannot take that. What else do we got on the gripes? Now this one's a little bit of a nitpick, but I have to say it because we've all been mocking the Snyderverse for the past three years. The movie is a flashback, and during the exposition dump, the movie has a flashback. I don't mind that at all. As I said, we're making fun of the Snyderverse, so the way that the story is told is very Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows, which is kind of neat. But I swear, the art design that they had turned it from Wonder Woman to 300 for just a moment. I laughed out loud. I was just like, wow. And then Leonidas did lead these guys to Thermopylae against Xerxes. And oh, man, it was, it was, uh. but you know... I didn't mind that for one major reason. This happened on Themyscira. And Themyscira has something that no other DC Cinematic Universe has. Color! Oh my god, it was so bright. Paradise Island looked like every part of Bora Bora that I'm never going to make enough money to see. I wanted to go there. I wanted to set up my lawn chair, grab a carton of cigarettes... And, like, have my espresso machine and my smokes and my wizard staff right there and just stay there forever. I loved, loved, loved Paradise Island because it looked like Paradise. I'm sorry. It was really, really good. However, turning it from that to 300, I had to laugh out loud only because we're in the Snyderverse and, man, they're going to sneak his style in there somewhere. That's not going to be the case in the future because, you know, check the trades. He's not in the series anymore, but, you know, that, that, that's what we got. Patty Jenkins killed it as the director of this movie. I want more of her because I, I, I love her work. I, I wanted to go back and look up some of her other projects, but, man, she killed it. She understood the characters. She understood how to film fight scenes, I personally am not thrown off by all the slow motion because we're dealing with superheroes and fast fight scenes and it's kind of a cheat or kind of a crutch, but outside of filming it in the very Asian manner, how else are we going to film fight scenes where you can show off these really cool over-the-top superheroic moves? Okay, so I don't mind that. What I do mind, however, is cute. Q. 
cute. Cute for the sake of cute. Drives me nuts. Now, I want to make it very clear right now. I don't mind child actors. I really don't. I was the biggest fan of Haley Joel Osment in the late 90s. Um, I, I think that child actors can still show talent, especially if you look at anything BBC. Any actor needs direction. And Patty Jenkins did the thing with the kid that I didn't like, which was making her cute for cute's sake. There are so many scenes with 10-year-old Diana that when you see them on screen, you're either going to go squee adorable or you're going to face palm so hard that you're going to need an anesthetic. You know what? Let's talk about those Amazons. This is the best depiction of Amazons I have ever seen. Ever. Hats off to the makeup artists of making this an island of women that were beautiful without being runway models for the Cardassian flavor. Uh, yeah, and I said Cardassian. I'm talking spoonhead levels of makeup. Okay, every single face in this was a naturally beautiful face, so kudos to the makeup job. And these women are women that I swear, if I'm walking down a dark alley, I want them walking with me because I would feel safe with these women by me. But seriously, these women were so badass. I, I, if you are a teenage girl and you want to learn how to fight and you're looking at something or you're looking for something to get pumped up with, I swear, that first hour of Wonder Woman is what we are talking about right there. Because I felt like picking up my sword, hitting the park, doing some of my sword forms, you know, practicing a whole bunch more sword play just to keep up with these women after watching the first few fight scenes. They were competent. They were in shape. They all looked like they knew what they were doing. The actresses and stunt people looked like they know what they were doing with the archery, with the sword play, with, believe it or not, the zip lining. Everything they did served a purpose and it looked good. I was so, so pleased with that. And Robin Wright, oh my God. All right. I am a big fan of House of Cards. You know, she is a fierce, fierce woman as far as acting and directing. But sometimes I forget how good an actress she is because... My first exposure was The Princess Bride. After seeing her in this movie, I am scared to death of Princess Buttercup. Oh my God. I can't watch The Princess Bride for the next month because I'll, I'll, all I'll see is the Dread Pirate Roberts fighting in a go Montoya and I'm going, why doesn't Buttercup get up and freaking stab somebody? Because, man, she was amazing. Just amazing. I loved seeing her in this role. And I want her to do more roles like it because the woman is fierce. Fierce, y'all. This movie is filled with women, not chicks, not girls. This is not a girl power movie. This is a movie about women, adult females being adult, except for Diana. This is her coming of age story. And the way that she transfers into the fish out of water story was really good. I really enjoyed that. Um, because she was naive, but not stupid. She had a mission. She was focused on that mission. And then she sees the world is not as simple as she thought it might have been. And I thought that was brilliant. They had a few comedic moments, but they never really came at the expense of her intelligence or her dignity. And Thor didn't even have that. Let's talk about the elephant in the room for those of you guys that have seen it. Okay? The end fight scene. All I'm going to say is this. They should have switched actors for the antagonist. And the fight shouldn't have been so over-the-top epic. Okay? So, that's my big thought. I understand it had to be epic because it's a superhero movie and people want superheroes to have big fights. Alright. I, I, I give you that. Now... I'm going to talk about the thing that this movie did really right with what Barbara Kiesel calls a vivid female character. A lot of things out there, I'm looking at you, Supergirl, on the CW, 
tend to make their lead principal female really strong with the technique of making everyone else pine over them, Buffy, or amazingly incompetent, or some sort of combination of both. And this brings me to my big surprise character in this movie, Steve Trevor. Now, I watched Wonder Woman in the 80s with Linda Carter, and I'm like, you know, Wonder Woman is awesome, and Linda Carter is really pretty, and I don't even like girls at this time because, you know, I was eight. And this Steve Trevor guy is just standing around saying, I'm Steve Trevor, I'm cool. And in the comic books, they talk about how he has military training, but who in comics doesn't these days? And in the New 52... In the New 52, he was just known as the guy that blew it with Wonder Woman. But in this movie, he was so good. I am officially a Steve Trevor fan, as long as Chris Pine plays him. Because this dude, he, you know, everything he did showed competence and intelligence. And this complimented Wonder Woman because... This is the dude who knows his way around the regular world of men and how complicated it is. And he's trying to show her how complicated the world is while trying to save it. But she's naive, not stupid. He's competent and not condescending in the wrong way. Not to say that he's not condescending. He's a little bit of a dick. But... He's only enough of a dick to do what he has to do as a soldier and a spy. And the way that he did his job in this movie, all I had to do was clap. He was such a ray of light and joy for me in this movie. And the fact that this movie was so enjoyable, putting the Chris Pine performance on top of that was like really good icing on really good cake. And this movie has really, really good cake um a new fan favorite out there is etta candy and etta candy is a decent sidekick very much a girl friday and they brought in a comedic comedic actress i don't know her name and i know you guys are going to light up the comments for it so i'm not even going to bother because you know who i'm talking about so let's not split hairs and she was fun she was fun i think and my girlfriend believes as well that she was underused. But yeah, I could have used maybe another three or four scenes with her. Um, now let's talk about the not quite Howling Commandos. Okay? This is a World War I piece, and there was a lot that it had in common with Captain America, the first Avenger. And you know what? I don't care. Captain America, the first Avenger, had a lot in common with the Rocketeer. Guess what? I like the Rocketeer. I like Captain America, the first Avenger. I like Wonder Woman. What? Fight me, all right? I know people say I want something original. I am a middle-aged man. I watch movies for a living. Before I did that, I watched movies for fun. I'm not going to see anything original. It's not going to happen. At least I don't believe that it happens because I've seen so many movies and read so many books and read so many comic books that everything I see is going to be a retelling of something else. And I accept that. And this retelling of the Rocketeer, of Captain America the Winter Soldier plus Thor, um, plus some other things, I enjoyed. Okay? I thought it was good. Now, her ragtag team of of dudes that she gathers up to do the thing and to get the mission. You know what? I liked them. I liked them a lot. Yeah, they were kind of, um, they were a little bit stereotypical. They were sort of the rainbow coalition from World War I. And that's fine. It was a planet-spanning war. All right? Um, the Fez-wearing Middle Eastern dude who was an actor and a spy, I thought was amazing. Um, he Every time he was on screen, he did something really neat. Um, the Scotsman, uh, my girlfriend and I kind of disagree on that one, but I like the fact that he was wounded psychologically because of World War I, and they didn't have a name for PTSD back then. 
but he clearly had it. Why'd they, why'd they bring him along? Make up your own reasons. It merits discussion, and I like that. And lastly, a lot of people have a problem with the last member of the Not Quite Hell and Commandos. Um, I personally don't. Okay, I don't have a problem with the Native American character. Now, don't get me wrong. I kind of look at him as the grandfather of Chief Abject Lesson from Suicide Squad. You know who I'm talking about. But this dude was competent. He was required. He pulled not only his weight, but a little bit more of his weight as far as the story arc went. He was Mr. Common Sense. They called him the Chief because, you know, World War I, people were racist then. Sorry to tell you, but if we, if we look at that with today's eyes, we're not going to learn anything. Okay? It happened. Let's accept it. Let's move on. His depiction of the character, I liked a lot. I really did like that character. I don't know where he's from in the comic books, but when something needed to be done, he did it. When they made it to the front and they were in the trenches, everyone not just liked him because he was pat-pat token person of color, but they genuinely were happy that he was back. They were glad to see him, and I liked that a lot, you know? Um, this movie was woefully low on black people, sorry, but given that you have a Native American, a Middle Eastern Muslim guy, a Scotsman, um, an American working for Britain, and Diana, we'll have room for more of my people of color, hopefully in the next few installments of the movies. I'm hoping that this becomes a franchise. If this is the turnaround for the franchise, then we've got an awesome future ahead, with the new stuff from Fox and the X-Men properties, the Deadpool properties, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which everybody swears by. And if this is the new direction that Warner Brothers has taken, yay, 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 yay. This might even kick Pixar in the butt to give us another movie like The Incredibles. All right? So, if you guys are wondering, it is now rating time. Wonder Woman, um, Wonder Woman for 2017 gets a full house, okay? It was that close, that close to a four of a kind. But the gripes that I mentioned earlier really kicked it down just a little bit. But you know what? As far as superhero movies, I haven't given a full house to, to a movie in a long time. As I said at the beginning, this is the best Warner Brothers superhero movie, in my opinion, since The Dark Knight. It has a strong full house. It might take the pot. All right, so with that, I'm your cinematic sorcerer, and um, let's see if we can do something about casting a spell on another movie so that we can get some more good stuff, okay? Thank you guys, and I will see you next week on The Dark Side of the Room.